questions out for you guys. Don't actually do them. Um, so homework problem one, right? I'd ask you guys to investigate the reference distribution for the likelihood ratio test for the over dispersion parameter in the negative binomial model relative to the Poisson, which is what that plug and plug like it would reduce to as you take the limit as alpha goes to zero. Did you guys confirm that for yourself, by the way? Anybody? You might want to do that. Right? You've, you've written down the log likelihood for the negative binomial model. You've got to think about what happens as alpha goes to zero. In theory, that thing should be going down to the log likelihood for the Poisson model, if this is going to make any sense whatsoever. Okay. So now you've got to do some rearranging of that. Okay, use some tricks on the gamma function in order to be able to take that limit. You're going to have to use L'Hopital's rule at some point, things like that. But you're going to get zeros over zeros to take the limit. But you should be able to see it. OK. So that's the first step, is, is verifying that. Um, the next thing uh, is that some folks said, look, I'm having a problem with convergence inside of glm.nv. Now, the reason why you're having a problem with convergence is the way that if you think about the negative binomial model, you get a mean variance relationship that looks like expectation of y equals mu i, variance of y i equals mu i times 1 plus this alpha mu i. Well, glm.mb parameterizes this thing in terms of theta equals to 1 over alpha. Okay. And so what's happening is as you're approaching down to the Poisson model, alpha is going to 0, theta is going to infinity. Okay. So, so that's where the convergence issues are coming because it's constantly trying to update and theta is growing, 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 growing. It's not stopping. Okay. But so if you, if you look at a particular fit, I have one here kind of set up for you guys where you don't get convergence. So the alteration limit is reached. What you will see is in this particular case, this is one simulated data example under your guys' mean structure. Theta is taken to be 670. That means your estimate for alpha is 1 over 670. Okay, I mean, it's continuing to grow. And mine's gotten larger, I should note. That I wanted it to grow as much as I could, so I ended up taking GLM control. I, I apologize, this is going to go black from time to time for you guys. It's just this wonderful computer that I'm working on right here. Um, I took GLM control, I set the maximum iterations up to 500. I think normally it's like 20 or 25, something like that. It's something fairly small okay, inside of GLM, so I'm letting that thing kind of crank through as I'm going through. And so theta is continuing to rise, and it will continue to rise in a lot of these cases. Um, but the key point is then you're kind of converging down on a log likelihood that looks like mu times 1 plus 1 over 670 in this case times mu. Okay, so getting very, very close to that plus on log likelihood. So the key thing there then I would say is you don't really have to worry so much about the lack of convergence. In other words, theta is getting so large that basically you essentially converge down on the plus on likelihood. Okay, so it's not that big of a deal. Okay. So that's one thing. The next thing, though, is that, apologies, it's going to happen. Hopefully it comes back. All right. uh, oh, man. Let's <laughs> see, we'll see what happens. Uh, the next thing, though, is that uh, some folks are coming up and saying, look, I'm getting LR statistics that are on the range of like 30 and 40, and at the end of the day, then when I do that, I end up getting a type 1 error rate that's like 30 to 35 percent. Anybody else seeing that? That's not good. <laughs> People are seeing. So, so what is happening is, and now let's let's look at two models that actually converge. So, so you, know, you didn't believe me on the trust. Everything these models actually did converge. Um, so the first one is. So again, these are just simulated data. First one is the fit from a model for a Poisson distribution, okay, or a Poisson fit in GLM. And if you look at the null deviance, and you look at the residual deviance there, keep those numbers in mind. In particular, keep the null deviance in mind for a second. 
And you go down and you say, okay, now I'm going to fit the negative binomial model. And now I look at the null deviance there. So up here it was, this is the reason why I'm doing this, clue you in on if something's wrong in the way that you're doing the likelihood ratio test. Okay, it must be supported out. The null deviance here is 3289. The null deviance down here is 3018. What is the null deviance, first of all? The null deviance is the model that only has an intercept in it relative to the saturated model, right? It's likely the ratio statistic for that. That's what the null deviance is. Okay. Um, should they be off by 200? They're the same model. No. Okay. So now, when you look at the residual deviance, and I would imagine those people that are getting likely at ratio tests, and, and part of this is driven by my key last time, which had an error in it that's speaking to this. It was being likely at ratio test statistics that were on the range of 30 and 40. If you look at the residual deviance, you were taking the difference between this value here, or this 257 here, and this 220 down here, and so that difference is 37. So that's like what a lot of you guys were seeing, what it were those, that, that magnitude of statistic. Okay. Now look at something, though. Look at the AIC for the Poisson model. What is AIC? It's minus 2 times the log likelihood plus 2p. Right? And that's what it comes down to be. Okay? P in this case is going to be constant in terms of the number of mean models inside of the, the model, right? So if you look at the AIC, so that means if I take the difference between these two things, that should be the difference between minus two times log likelihood, yeah? Okay. So you look at the AIC now for the negative binomial model, that's 919. You look at the AIC now for the Poisson model, that's 921. So the difference in minus two times log likelihood of those two things is really two, not 37. You guys with me? So what's happening is the saturated models, and you can see it in the null model difference, the saturated models are coming up different, and that's because there's an extra term there that's coming from that gamma expansion in the negative binomial. So if you, the likelihood ratio test, right, is just minus two times the, the, the log likelihood ratio. So in other words, minus two times the difference in the log likelihoods for those two models you're trying to compare. I've taught you in the past that you've been able to take the difference in the deviance because often you're anchored to the saturated model, right? So the saturated model, when you take those differences, cancels out. And so you just get back to the minus two times log likelihood between two models you're trying to compare. But in this case, the saturated log likelihood is different between the two models because it's leaving that alpha term in there, and then there's a big sum over that expansion of the gamma function that you guys write down in homework one that's left over. And that's causing problems. So you're not really taking the true difference between the two log likelihoods in that case. The true difference between the two log likelihoods you can actually get at from that AIC, that 921.5 versus 919.5, really. So your likelihood ratio statistic value here is approximately 2. Okay. So a cleaner way of doing that, and, and, and so I realized that there was an error back on homework 1 for the key that I had had put out there, um, where I did take the difference in the two deviances and compare them to the chi-square. To fix that, what you want to do is you want to pull off the actual log likelihood values. Well, if you look at the names from a fit for, from the negative binomial model, glm.mb, you know, you have something down here that's two times log likelihood. In other words, it'll give it back to you, okay? And it actually reports it in the summary. You can see it right here. Okay. If you look at the names for a fit from a Poisson model, there is no log likelihood floating around there. It does not give it back as a standard element that comes back in that, that object. Okay. So you gotta, you got to pull it off in a different way. It's easy to do that. You can pull it off just with the function log like. That's just a generic function for any regression model that's based upon maximum likelihood. It'll go through and it'll pull off the log likelihood value for you. Okay. So now, what I'm doing is I'm computing just, if you will, by hand, so to speak, minus two times the difference in the log likelihoods for that negative binomial model and the Poisson model. Everybody okay? Rather than taking the two deviances which are not anchored to the same saturated fit. Okay, so if you do that then, 
this is just a quick simulation under what you guys have got going on. I'll run that through and let's look at it very quickly. back things that are a bunch of warnings. Those warnings are coming from the non-convergence, right? Now again, if you look at those, theta is getting very, very large. I'm going to show you kind of a cleaner fix in just a second for this, but if you now look at, say, this LRT statistics that I have, so this is, I just did it over 500 right now, you're going to notice something. You're going to notice some of them are negative. They're small, but they're negative. Should they be negative? No, right? Because I'm going from a full model to a reduced model in some sense. So that's why you can approximate this with the chi square. It's always positive values, right? Think about it like that. The negatives are coming from the, the, the non convergence. Okay, so those are the ones. Now, they're all very, very small. So it's not really impacting you too much. If you look at the distribution of these guys, and then you just throw a chi square on top of it with one degree of freedom. To see what I was trying to get you guys to see in the homework, which is now I get a bunch of things. These are those kind of slightly negative values that are sitting just around zero. And this is a chi square one degree of freedom that's sitting here. And you can kind of see you don't have as heavy of a tail, right? Meaning that it's going to be conservative relative to a chi square one. That's what I was saying. It's somewhere between a chi like a zero, a degenerate distribution, and a chi square one. It's like a mixture of those two things. This is like my zero here, and then everything else that's going on. Okay. <coughs> okay. So the negative values are because of the non-convergence of geom. Exactly. So that log likelihood is creeping, 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 creeping up. Beta is going off, trying to go off to infinity. And I stopped it at 500 iterations, basically. Okay. If, well, you, if you took that maximum iterations to, say, 50,000, you'll get even closer. Those things are starting to come down. Theta is going to infinity. Alpha is going to zero. Right. Theta is going off to infinity. That's why it's not stopping, right? Because the way the parameterization is. If theta was going down to zero, you kind of hit it. You'd be done. Okay. So, you know, a cleaner way probably to visualize this is to not have negative values in there. So, like in my simulation, what I did was I commented out I want to shade the negative values, but. Um, is to kind of go through and what's happening is wherever I've reached that maximum limit on the iterations, if I get that warning that comes back on me, then what I can do is I can say, look, this thing is converging. It's getting so close to a Poisson distribution. It's basically trying to fit a Poisson at that point. You know, I mean, it's just going off to infinity. So just replace it with the Poisson, which means your LR stat is zero, basically. That and that helps you conceptualize why it's this mixture between zero and a chi square one, because you're kind of approaching so much that you're kind of hitting exactly a Poisson log likelihood. Okay, you just haven't gotten there yet. So you can do it either way. You can leave the iterations. You can leave it in there with the warnings, and then have the slightly negative values. You'll get the roughly. You'll get the exact same answer. In fact, at the end of the day, but if you wanted to visualize what the empirical distribution is, it's a little easier to do it this way. So I'll run that guy. Now I'll have a bunch of zeros floating around in here. So this should be basically the exact same picture that I had before. It is. Now this represents truly zero. <laughs> and if you wanted to look at out your type 1 error, so I would just sum up how many of those likelihood ratio statistics. And again, I ask for the type 1 error if you're really comparing this back to our reference distribution. It's a chi square with one degree of freedom. <coughs> so in this case, what I was saying earlier was that it should be a conservative test. So my observed type 1 error in this case is 1%. And I'm doing, quote unquote, a level 0.05 test, right? Or I'm trying to do. So that's the conservativeness of mixing between the zero and the square one. Okay? Is that all right for everybody? Okay. So, key thing, a take home message for you guys is well, one is you, you know, Gillen makes errors all the time, but if you go back to homework one, key number one, or homework one key, you should 
and say, I'd ask you guys to do this, I need to fix this now. When I produced an LR test for over dispersion here, I pulled the deviances and then compared it to a guy square one, I should not have done that. Okay, I should have pulled the log likelihood here and I should have pulled the log likelihood here to the difference in minus two. Okay, so I will fix that, but note that. Okay, guess with me? Not anchored at the same spot. In, in my slight defense, SAS is a little smarter about this. SAS, when it gives you back the deviance, anchors it back to the same saturated model from the Poisson likelihood. Okay, so you can just take the deviances there. But I didn't realize that GL1 by MB and the mass function was not doing that. Okay, so that's good. We discovered this pretty good. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, when you got the chi squared statistic for the likelihood ratio test, it used the difference between two times the log likelihood in both cases? Why wouldn't you just use one times the log likelihood? The difference between. Uh, so, like, you take two. Well, the definition of the log, the likelihood ratio mm -hmm. statistic, right, is minus two times the log of the likelihood ratio. Oh. Remember, you get that two that comes out from the second order Taylor expansion. You can always remember this by thinking about how you derive it. We did a second order Taylor expansion, so you get a one half on the second term, the second order term. That one half comes over, the two comes over, and so that's why you always got that two sitting there. Mm -hmm. So that's why when you go into and do a summary of fit dot nb, it comes back and it says, okay, here's two times your log likely, and that's what it'll give you back. And so, but when I now pull from the log likelihood function, I need to multiply that guy by two because it's not multiplied by two. Okay. So just for fun, by the way, you do get a standard error back from the glm.mb fit, right? And that's just the square root of the peak diagonal of Fisher information, because doing maximum likelihood on that thing. So you could go and you could compare, I'm laughing at me, you could go and you could compare the performance of the Walt statistic in this case as well, right? I mean, you can, you can formulate the Walt statistic take this thing squared divided by that guy, right? Just compare it to a chi-square one. You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. okay. So you got another test that you can do there. You have a third test that you can look at as well, which is the score, mm -hmm. right? Okay, mm -hmm. so you can look at the score as well. Now, it turns out, you saw the performance of the likelihood ratio test if you just try and apply general theory to it. It's quite conservative relative to what the theory tells you. Do you guys have a hypothesis as to what would probably perform the best in this case if you're thinking about likelihood ratio test, score test, or wall test? I'll give you a hint. Which of those tests do not require you to estimate anything about the log likelihood under the alternative hypothesis, which is where you're having a problem. Is it lack of congruence and things coming down? Score. The score, right? The score is always under the null. It just says, give me the log likelihood for the Poisson model, alpha equals zero, right? And hit it by the Fisher information under the null. So it turns out that the score actually tends to do the best here. Okay, in other words, and what I mean by that is it comes closest to the nominal level 0.05 that you're trying to aim for with that test. Mm -hmm. So, again, I encourage you to do it. You can pull off the log likelihood. I already pulled it off, actually, from the, from the Poisson model. You can pull the score off of there as well in a similar way. Hit it by Fisher information. Beat the score. So, um... And, 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 and once I said that, by the way, all of this stuff, and I realized I just, this is how easy it is to just come up with like little simple papers, right? I, I went through and I did all this, and then I was like, I wonder if anybody's actually looked at this. So 2012, somebody actually just wrote about this, right? And they kind of go through 
similar types of variables. Okay. So you can look at that paper if you want as well. But you can't, you're not allowed to turn this in, by the way. <laughs> Check your answers on. <coughs> all righty, all righty, all righty. So, any other questions right now? Homework, past lecture, anything like that? No. Okay. Now let's get back into lecture seven. And the goal of lecture seven is to get you guys thinking about descriptive statistics or exploratory data analysis for the covariance structure. And pop quiz, why do I care about exploratory data analysis for the covariance structure? If you had to explain to somebody, why are you doing this? So you can get a reasonable estimate of which structure you want to use. Why do I want a reasonable estimate? What do I get from that? Accurate inference. Do I believe the inference that comes out after I've made all of these underlying assumptions on this in by in covariance you matrix, little accurate. in by little in? What's that? You want more accurate inference relative to the more wrong inference that you could be doing? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some of us do. Um, so go back, Nina. What were you going to say? I liked your first answer. We'll come back to Francis' answer in just a second. Well, I just said that um, because. I want to see if I can make a reasonable, like the assumptions I make is, are reasonable. Okay. Mm -hmm. But why do I care? So, so, and this is why I'm asking the question. Can I get consistent and unbiased estimates if I just assume that everything is independent and go and do OLS? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can get a bias. Yeah? yeah? The answer is yes. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can write it down. It looks like X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. Take expectation three. You get X beta on the other side. You get a beta that comes out at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Done. So I can use an independence working correlation structure. Okay. So now, if I do that, Francis. <laughs> how you doing? All right. Good. Um, and then I have inference that's reported at the end of the day. Now I'm, I'm almost guaranteed to be wrong, right, if I've got truly <coughs> clustered samples in some way where I have correlation, okay? So then my answer becomes, well, but what can I do about that? Use a robust variance estimator, right, with a reasonable sample size. Okay, so I can fix up the inference on that. So now I'm back to valid inference. Everybody with me? Okay. So then the question is, why am I doing EDA on the correlation structure to get a reasonable estimate? I am doing it. I'm teaching you guys about it, so I believe you should probably do it. Oh, I heard it. Where is it? Efficiency. Thank you. Thank you, Arsene. Efficiency, right? Because if I know that if I wait by the true inverse of the variance covariance matrix, I will get back to homoscedasticity, which means I can appeal to Gauss-Markov, which means those estimators are the best linear unbiased estimators, again, at the end of the day. Do you guys, are you guys with me on that? I mean, if you hit everything by sigma to the minus one half all the way through that regression model, your residual variance covariance matrix looks like a diagonal of ones and zeros on the off diagonal. Okay, convince yourself of that. You're back to homoscedasticity. Okay. So now, Hina, you know, the reason why I care about this and the reason why I'm looking for it is because I may not get to the true variance covariance matrix. That's probably pretty tough to do. I mean, we're trying to estimate the mean model right now, and <laughs> that's that's hard enough relative to the second moment. But the closer and closer I get to that true variance covariance matrix. To use that knowledge for my weighting, the more efficient that I get in those estimates that come back out. You guys with me on that? And then at the end of the day, I still won't believe it, and so what I'll do is I'll fix them back up, like Jalen said, with the robust variance estimator. That, that's my general strategy on these things, okay? So EDA for the covariance matrix, to try and gain as much efficiency as I can. That's what you guys are looking at in your last homework problem, by the way, is to see what happens as you get closer to the true variance covariance matrix. But then to fix up inference at the end of the day with something that's more of an empirical estimate of the standard errors. Okay? All right. So again, kind of think back to always ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm, what I'm doing? Okay. All right. Quick question. Yes. Um, so back in 211, when we said get close to the variance covariance matrix, it kind of makes sense because we're just trying to get close on this diagonal terms. But when there's covariances, what does being close really mean in terms of estimating covariance matrix? 
Well, still, I mean, what I would love to do here, let's pull it up. Simplest of terms, right, Jalen? You've got a model that looks like this. For the ith subject, you've got a vector of responses. Now you've got a vector of mean zero residuals. I'm assuming we're putting a intercept in the model. And they have some various covariance matrix sigma, okay? So now, what I would love to do saying, well, what does it mean to get close to that? Well, getting close to that is basically getting to the inverse of that sigma i squared times, or sigma times sigma here, sigma inverse here, and sigma being identity. That's what it means. I mean, that's exactly what we're striving for. I know that if I hit this, this is what I will get back to. And so if I have each of those off diagonal elements as close as possible, and I take the inverse of that full sigma that I'm going to assume, and when I hit everything by sigma to the minus one half, I get back to an identity matrix. Is that okay? okay. So it's, it's absolutely the same thing that we were doing before, it's just sigma was diagonal. And okay. now we're just trying to get the off diagonals as well. So we're moving through. Okay? Okay. So in this case, Independent sources, so believe it. Believe that, John. Okay. Yes. Um, about gaining efficiency. Um, so, you know, we're fitting. Let's say we fit the same model, right? We do it one with OLS. We do one with um, having some variance structure. Mm -hmm. um, as I prefer, I guess, a variance structure. Um, the efficiency that we gain if we end up doing robust anyways, is, is that simply from the A inverse, the A inverse? This, or? So you're not gaining efficiency from the robust range estimator. Okay, I, I, so this is, this is a critical point. So you said the efficiency that we gain from, from using the robust range estimator. That was the, the I believe, the no, statement no, no, that I No, no, the efficiency heard. that we gain between the two, right, by, by, by estimating a variance yes. structure yes. beforehand. But so if we're going to end up doing the robust anyways, right, the efficiency that we gain is from the A inverse, E A inverse, is that, is that A inverse? Yeah, is that so. That's different? So it is effectively. Um, in here, let me, let me try and spell it out a little bit more for you. Okay, so. Estimator that I have, I'm going to assume to be beta hat 
independence, okay? So that's that working independence model. So what that means is I'm doing OLS. I'm slapping everything into LM, letting it come back with estimates for me, okay? So this guy looks like, uh, or is going to be approximately normal, I should say, distributed beta. It's going to have variance that's going to be approximately a in inverse comma i. Okay, so I'm just trying to spell this all out from what you're saying here. B in comma i, because that's going to be that sandwich that has no weight inside the middle. And it's going to look like x transpose x, true variance of y, x transpose x. Okay. And then a in inverse comma i. Okay. Now, I've written all these down in lecture, but make sure that you understand what those things are. This a n is what? It's a n inverse. You guys should know it right off the top of your head. I just did OLS, and this is the model-based variance estimates, the Fisher information, right? So it is nothing more than sigma squared times x transpose x inverse, where x is my big design matrix. Are you guys with me on that? That's what that is. That's the model-based variance estimator that comes out of just assuming true independence, no weighting on anything. What is the sigma squared that's out in front? It's like the average of all the diagonals of the variances, right? Because we know that they're likely to be varying. Okay, so it's going to take the average. Yeah? And then what I'm going to get in the middle here is something that looks like x transpose, but then a true variance of y sandwiched in the middle. And it's not going to go away. Okay, again, it's been in your notes at least three times, so, so make sure of that. So now... I might assume a different weight matrix. So what I'm having you guys do on homework is I'm having you guys, the truth for your data is an autoregressive structure, but then I'm having you guys walk back and say, suppose I just assume that it's exchangeable, right? I'm going to go fit a model and now I'm going to assume that all my off diagonals are constant and I'll assume that my diagonals are a, cons a different constant, okay? Well, this guy, will still be consistent. We're centered at the same spot. Oops. W. 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 Inverse. So W might have some simplified structure. Through our EDA, right, you know, we will choose that simplified structure. We'll kind of say, okay, it looks like, you know, we've got just a constant correlation, so maybe I'll assume it's exponential, or it looks like I've got this serial process, so I might assume it's AR1. So that's okay. Your answer was going to be right either way. Choose A or B. The point is, is B is going to be equal to A, so two of those guys are going to cancel, right? That's going to be the correct model specification there. And that's the true variance of that. Okay, so now Arnie's question was, well, where does the gain in efficiency come from? Well, I'm going to give you two answers. I know you guys don't like multiple answers, Arnie, but one, it goes right back to your intuition. One says, if I upweight observations that have low variance and downweight observations that have high variance, and I do that even being slightly close to what the truth is, and I take an average of those things, which is not what beta hat is, then I'm going to get something with smaller variance at the end of the day. You guys with me on that? That seemed reason that's what Gauss Markov tells you by the way. I mean that's that is the intuition of Gauss Markov. Okay? That's one. Arnie, your question really comes down to saying, yes, the closer and closer that W gets to sigma to the minus half, the closer and closer this thing starts getting to the identity matrix. And that's kind of Jalen's question just a minute ago as well, is really what's happening there, okay? So as I get closer and closer, this thing, 
basically starts collapsing down towards A N. Okay, and you just left out back over here. So I think that that was probably what you were saying just a minute ago, but that is exactly what's happening. And so you will see, in fact, you'll be able to look at this, and I would encourage you to look at it on your homework. When I have you guys go under an autoregressive process, but then fit these two misspecified models, look at the difference in the model-based variance estimate versus the robust. You're going to see a big correction there, which is what you would expect to see. Like you're, you know, this is clearly wrong, and so when you put in the correction, it's going to be pretty far off. Okay? But when you go to something that's getting closer, when I have you do an exchangeable matrix, and it says, well, I'm not going to assume I've got zero on all the off-diagonals, but I'll assume I've got some constant value that's there. Okay? And I'll estimate that as an average of all the off-diagonals then this thing's going to start getting closer to the identity. The correction that you have for all of this relative to just this is going to be much smaller at that point. Okay, so that's how you can start to visualize this stuff. And that's what people, a lot of people do in practice when they're kind of doing an, an analysis. They'll say, okay, here's my model-based estimate, here's my robust variance estimate, and boy, are they different. It's a good thing I, you know, I need to use the robust variance estimator. I think that's a really bad strategy, to be quite honest. I think the better strategy is if I've got a large sample size, forget about it. I'll just use the robust variance estimator anyways. I mean, why do I have to have it be different to tell me? I know it's a consistent estimator. You know that already, okay? But that is a strategy that some folks will take. Okay. So, again, what I want you guys to see and what you should start to see on the homework is if you look at the variance, I, I can't resist. I've got to give you guys the punchline here. The variance of... Sigma to the minus one half over the variance of beta hat i. Just naively going and throwing the OLS estimator at this thing. Has anybody done the last homework problem yet? You guys haven't done homework yet? <laughs> On the diagonals, that thing's going to be about 0.5. For that, that set of scenario that I said, so you guys can get a check of what you're looking at there. What does that mean to me? So, so take, take, here. Let's do it like this. When you look at the slope parameter, I want to be somewhat technical here. You're not going to get like a scape of that, right? So take the two, two element of each one of those things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is like for my slope parameter in your, your particular model. So that's the 2-2 two, two element, the, the variance of the slope parameter versus the variance of the slope parameter in, that, in the simulation setting that you've got. You're going to see that the variance, if you use the correct weighting scheme, this is the true variance, by the way, the true variance. Okay, There's no hat on these things. It's approximately 0.5. That means that your variance is about half the size if you use the correct weight, Gauss-Markov, versus if you just naively weighted everything equally. Okay? So that's the gain in efficiency, you know, and that's why we're starting. So, so now the question is, but I'm going to be wrong. Now look at what happens when you do this, and that's why I have you do it on the homework, right? So now you've got beta hat sigma to the minus one half, two comma two, over variance two comma two beta hat to W, where on the homework I said, take W to be exchangeable. Just make it at the simplest kind of non-off diagonal that you can. Okay? It's not the truth. The truth is autoregressive. I'll take it to be exchangeable. Anybody want any guesses? Close. That's the impact of doing some EDA and trying to account for some of the correlation, right? I get almost back to full efficiency. And that's one example, right? I have you simulating under one particular example, one other correlation structure. But that's the key. I'm still wrong, but I've gained back a ton of efficiency by just allowing for the fact that I do have this correlation between these observations and I'm waiting relative to that as I go. Okay? You guys with me? That's pretty cool stuff, right? I mean, there are, there are very few times in life where you get things quote unquote for free. This is almost one of them. Like, I just, you know, I've got this very complicated autoregressive structure and now I just slap something that's constant at it and I'm almost back to full efficiency and guess what? My variance is off by a little bit, but I'll go back and fix it up with a robust variance estimator. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that in life. I'm gonna be honest with you, okay? okay. 
So that's hopefully what you guys are going to start to see okay, on the phone homes. And so, again, the whole purpose of the EDA that I'm telling you is let's characterize it, let's do the best we can to come up with a simplified structure that's kind of as close as to what we have as possible to get us here and then fix it all up at the end of the day. Now I've got like five minutes left for another, another question. What's that now? So what N are you referring to? Capital N as a number of independent sampling units or little n as number of observations on each sampling unit? Little n. So little n, so capital N is not going off to infinity. Well, because if capital N goes to infinity, then just to one. No, 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 no. They're going at the same rate. They're going both going at root capital N. This thing is not going to one. I mean, that's what it is, right? I mean, they're going off at the same rate. Root capital N. This is again the true variance of this guy. Okay. It's the true variance of that guy. And so now, as little n starts going off to infinity, and I hold capital N constant, I don't even get this. <laughs> I mean, that's not even coming into play anymore, right? I mean, do you see what's happening there? The, the dimension of that sigma is starting to shoot off. And that means the number of parameters that I'm dealing with is exploding, but I get no repeated independent information on those parameters to be able to throw in these estimates. Okay. What's that? Well, that's a simplifying, you know, so now, how are you going to give me valid inference on that, right? So, oh, you guessed correctly? Okay, so if you guessed correctly, fine. Then you're back to this guy, right? I mean, everything would hold. If you guessed correctly, you can actually write these things down now. It's just a linear combination of multivariate normals. We know a little something about the exact distribution of linear combinations of multivariate normals. And so if you knew exactly what that distribution was, fine. You can deal with it just in an exact context. That's what time series, by the way, does, right? I mean, they kind of say, look, I'm going to make this very specific assumption and I'm going to live and die with it because I've got nothing else to go on. I can't borrow an average off of independent sampling units. Right? And so, again, that's why I don't teach time series is because I like to do independent sampling units and try to borrow off of these things. So I like capital N going off to infinity and little n staying somewhere reasonable. <laughs> I mean, truly the theory says that little n over capital N need to go off to a constant. I mean, that's what's happened, right? As you start gaining more independent sampling units, you better be gaining, or sorry, more information on each sampling unit, you better be gaining more independent sampling units at the same rate, at least. So most of the theory that we have in kind of correlated data methods, think about information coming from independent clusters versus information within the cluster, the ratio of those things have to go up to a constant. Did you say yesterday that about, like, M should be like capital N should be about 7, 10 times zero. So yeah, for the robust range estimator, and again, very kind of hand wavy ad hoc, but about 10 to 1. About 10 to 1. Okay, so do you think even if like, as long as they're 10 to 1, this thing will hold? What's that now? Uh, the, the ratio should be like so good. Oh, yeah. I mean, this... This says nothing about the robust variance estimator. What I, I, I want to make that clear. What I have written up here says absolutely nothing about the robust variance estimator. Are you guys with me on that? When I write variance of bait, oh, first of all, what is this? When I write variance of beta hat, I mean the true variance of what beta hat is. The robust variance estimator is trying to get an estimate of what that true variance is, right, Hina? Yeah. But when I write this, I'm talking about the true variance of what beta hat is. So this has nothing to do with the robust variance estimator. Okay, no, I was actually referring to Marcella's question, uh -huh. where she said that M is going really big, like little M is going really big. Yeah. But what if I'm increasing capital M2 so that the ratio is still 10 to 1? Will this var like the ratio of the variances be so good? That, that, that will hold. Again, okay. that's the ratio of the true variances as capital N goes off to infinity. Okay. This is, they're going to cancel off. They're going at the same rate. Right? Yep. Uh, now, 
this thing decided it wants to work and come on while I'm actually standing up here. So. Okay. Is that okay for everybody? Yeah? You guys good? Okay. Iran seems to think yes. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw my watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. So now I've got like literally one minute left. <laughs> oh, you know what? Have a good day. <laughs>